Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and to speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On today's episode, we speak with Simon Anholt, the founder of the renowned Nation Brand Index, an independent policy advisor to nearly 60 countries around the world and publisher of the Good Country Index, which ranks nations based on their contributions to people and planet. With Qatar spending billions to host the Middle East First World Cup, we ask Mr. Anholt whether the event will succeed and what Arab cities such as Riyadh, Dubai or Doha need to to do to become the next London or New York. Mr. Anhold, thank you for joining us on Frankly Speaking. Now, you are credited with coining the term nation brand back in the 1990s. Now, since then, many people have come up with their own definitions. In fact, we've seen an entire industry developed from marketeers turned nation branding experts. Frankly speaking, is this what you initially set out to achieve? Is this what you intended? And is it even appropriate to consider nation's brands in the same way we do shampoos, soft drinks, or perfumes? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, Katie, and I think it's one that's, that, that's worth answering carefully. There's no question that the images of countries are very, very important to those countries. There's no question that if a country has a positive and powerful international image, then basically everything is easy and everything is cheap, right? You can get tourists, you can get investment, your products sell well, everybody wants to visit, everybody wants to hire your people. If you're unlucky enough to have a weak or a negative image, everything is more difficult and everything is more expensive. So you really, as a country, trade at a disadvantage if your image is negative or weak. But that's just a very different thing from saying that you can fix the image of a country if you don't like it. And I guess that, to me, is where the interesting conversation takes place. We all know that image is very important. We all know that some countries have very bad images. We know it's not always fair or up to date, that image. But what you can actually do about it is a much more interesting question. And, and the phrase nation branding has always bothered me, even though I'm supposed to be the guy who invented it, just because it sounds so easy. It makes it sound as if you don't like your image. All you have to do is to spend enough money on, on public relations or logo design or an advertising campaign, and suddenly everybody will change their mind. But it's very, very clear that that doesn't happen. At a talk at the Riyadh Book Fair last September, you went as far as saying that money spent on nation brand advertising campaigns not only goes to waste, but rather is a crime. Now, surely chief executives and big strategy consultants behind these campaigns would be able to give some pretty convincing figures about user engagement, viewership and impressions. So I have to ask, where is the crime in that? If they really can produce data that shows that any country has materially improved its image by means of communications, marketing communications, I'd love to see it. But the reality is that I've been looking for evidence that this kind of activity works for, for 20 years, and I still haven't found it. It's really important, though, that we have to be careful here. I'm not talking about tourism promotion. I'm not even talking about investment promotion. If a country wants to sell its products or its services, or it wants to sell vacations in the country, then of course advertising works because it's a straightforward marketing proposition. You're saying, buy this product, it's good. And then if you spend enough money on advertising and it's good enough advertising, it will work. But what I'm saying is that those tools that work so well for selling products and services, they don't work for changing the images of countries. That's something different. That's called propaganda. And propaganda doesn't work internationally, because if the government of a country stands up and spends loads of money saying, you think we're terrible, but we're not, we're wonderful, who is even going to listen to that? And all the evidence is that it's just money burned. Countries are judged by what they do and by what they make, not by what they say about themselves. 
So you say actions speak louder than words. I think it's particularly interesting when we look at something like Qatar and the World Cup. Of course, Qatar has spent $220 billion over the last 12 years for the rights to host the first FIFA World Cup in the Middle East. Now, there are many marketing specialists out there who felt the event would be a huge success, felt it would be a gigantic opportunity for such a small country to be able to show the huge power, the huge soft power they could wield. And, and really take their nation brand forward. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Do you think the event has been successful and will it be successful? Well, looking looking back over the um, 20 odd years that I've been running um, surveys on this, the evidence is that running a big sport, hosting a big sporting event like the like the Football World Cup or the, or the Summer Olympics in particular, generally speaking, it has no impact on the image of the country, at least not beyond a few months. Within about six months or so, people have forgotten about it, generally speaking. Um, occasionally, it can do quite serious damage to the country's image if the thing is very controversial or if it shows things about the country that are worse than what people was expecting. And that tends to be the pattern um, throughout. Now, in the case of Qatar, it may well be that if what you're actually looking for is just crude awareness, in other words, we want more people to have heard about the existence of this country because it's anonymous, then there's no question that hosting a major sporting event will just in a, in a, in a raw way raise the profile of your country for a relatively short period. And if you know exactly what you're going to do to follow on from that immediately afterwards and keep the momentum going and keep the profile high, then that could work as part of a slightly more sophisticated strategy. But believing, as many host countries do, that just hosting a successful major event will suddenly turn your image from bad into good or from unknown into super well-known, that's just an illusion. It just doesn't happen. So if I understand what you're saying correctly, you're saying that countries hosting huge international sporting events don't necessarily improve a country's brand. Um, you know, I think really when we consider, of course, there's many nations around the world, they bid very aggressively for the opportunity to be able to host big events from the Formula One, the boxing championships, the Olympics as well. I know you were recently saying on one of your podcasts, hosting big events like this tends to magnify any potential issues out there. Is that, would you say that's correct? Yes, that's exactly right. This is not to say that these events are, are completely pointless. Um, because there, there can be other valuable effects of hosting a major event, um, particularly the smaller ones can be very useful tactical instruments, if you like, uh, for countries to in engage with the international community. So I'm not saying these things are necessarily a waste of, of time and money. What I'm saying is that uh, the effects are very subtle and slightly unpredictable. And it can just as easily harm your image if people start seeing things that, as I said before, are worse than what they were expecting to see. So it's not a simple, straightforward relationship between hosting an event and, and the image of the country. It can do you harm. The most common effect is no effect at all. The most positive effects have been seen in the past on countries that already had quite a good image, but had a slightly lower profile. So take the Australian Summer Olympics, for example, the Sydney Olympics. That was a good example of a country that was already very well respected and people were quite interested in it. And what they saw during the Olympics was all great and it confirmed what they were hoping to see in Australia. And so it bumped up Australia's image for quite a while afterwards. But, you know, I guess the question you have to ask yourself before hosting a major event is, is there anything here that the international TV cameras could show the audiences back home that would disappoint or upset or alarm people if they saw it. And if there is, then you need to be very, very careful about what you're doing. Because remember, most people aren't watching football or athletics most of the time. They're watching video documentaries, hours and hours and hours about the host city, the host country. And those reporters, those TV crews, they're going to be crawling all over the country and city trying to find interesting, shocking, controversial things to show their viewers. Well, I find that very interesting because throughout your work, you've repeatedly cited that people around the world respect nations with sport achievements or those that are advanced in science. So do you think that the recent Saudi win over Argentina in the World Cup or the UAE Mars mission do more good for their nation brands than public relations or advertising campaigns? 
I certainly do, but in the longer term. I think the mistake is always to expect an immediate return. And one of the things um, I used to say a lot when I still liked using the word brand, and I tend to avoid it now, um, is your, your brand is not your message. It's the context in which your message is received. So in other words, Saudi Arabia's image, which is quite a weak one, it's a country that people know very little about, everything that Saudi Arabia does is seen through the prism of that rather weak, rather negative image. And so what you'll find is that the first 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 amazing things you do, they are going to be interpreted negatively. They are going to be discussed in a very prejudiced way. And a large number of people and the media are going to see them as further evidence of whatever they think is wrong with the country. So in a sense, it's very disheartening. For the first several years, you're going to find that almost whatever you do that tries to be good and helpful, like, for example, giving aid to developing countries and all the rest of it, it's going to be interpreted in a negative way because the negative image has that effect. But gradually, over time, if you're persistent and you're st strategic about it, and above all, you're sincere with those gestures, you're not doing them because you want people to admire you. You're doing them because you believe they're the right thing to do. Over time, it will begin to shift. But this is not something that can be fixed overnight or in a matter of weeks or years. The, the images of countries take literally generations to form. They don't come through the media from, from one day to the next. They come through the whole of the culture that surrounds us. I'm from the United Kingdom. My view of France is something that I learned from the age of two. I learn it from the society around me. The average Saudi person's view of Bahrain is something that they learn from the culture around them throughout their lives. And we don't change our minds about other countries quickly or willingly. In fact, one of the remarkable things about all of the research I've done on country images is how incredibly stable they are. They really don't change from year to year. We hang on to those prejudices about other countries for dear life, and we really don't want to change them. Let's talk more about Riyadh, because in the coming days, Riyadh will be hosting the Global Summit of the World Travel and Tourism Council. Now, this is going to be a big conference full of world experts who will want to sell their country as the next ideal holiday destination. So what is the difference between destination marketing and the concept of a nation brand in the way you envision it? And are the two separatable? Yeah, well, destination marketing is a very honest and very straightforward marketing exercise. You've got a product which is called Vacations in Saudi Arabia, and you want to market it to potential tourists, to potential purchasers of that product. Uh, advertising, marketing, online, offline, all, of, all the conventional tools of commercial promotion are very, very useful to do that. And in a sense, it's very straightforward, because if you do lots of it and you do it well, people will come. You can... Uh, you can deliberately cause more people to visit your country through effective uh, marketing. There's no question about that. Now, whether they'll come back again is another question, because that's to do with the quality of the experience they get when they, when they arrive. But I don't think it's at all a difficult or complicated thing, promoting tourism. And I also think it's absolutely the right thing for Saudi Arabia to be doing and to be spending uh, lots of money on it to do it well, because... Part of Saudi Arabia's problem and the reason why its image is rather a weak one is because, frankly, people know so little about the country. As we know, it's been hidden from the rest of humanity for nearly a century. And what is needed more than anything else is for people to see it within their own eyes, with their own eyes, to meet Saudi people, to see this mysterious land. And it's part of human nature that once you've met people from another country, what you've seen that country actually looks like you will almost automatically start to feel more positively about it. We, we tend to harbor negative thoughts and especially fears about places we haven't seen, about people we haven't met, because it's like a nightmare. You're just imagining things. You can't see them properly. But the moment you're actually physically there, all of my uh, research shows that the experience of visiting a country in person will tend to bias you in favor of that country, apparently for the rest of your life. So there's no doubt that it's a good thing to do, but it shouldn't be confused with deliberately manipulating the image of the country because that's a secondary effect. You have been a recent visitor to Riyadh. Now, Riyadh City wants to double its population by 2030. It's investing heavily in major projects which are going to create jobs for both locals and expatriates. So what were your thoughts after your recent visit there? And what do you think the city needs in order to become another London, New York or, or Tokyo? You ask uh, what, what can Saudi Arabia do in the longer term to make uh, Riyadh uh, more attractive? Well, just more of the same. 
you've you've really got to be constantly thinking what is it that people want and making it into an attractive destination an attractive product for people to 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 buy into is really only part of the story and what my research has shown over the years is that having a beautiful city or having an uh, attractive destination or a beautiful nature or a great culture or nice people this is all part of the attraction of a country, but fundamentally the thing that matters most is that people should feel glad that you're there. And that's got nothing to do with whether they wanna go on holiday or invest in your economy. It's got something to do with how they perceive you as a player in the international community. Do I feel that Saudi Arabia is a country that is contributing something to the future of humanity, that's contributing to the world outside its own borders? Because what Saudi Arabia does for its own people even what Saudi Arabia does for the migrants in its own country, what Saudi Arabia does for its own cities and its own landscape is interesting up to a point. But in the end, there are 200 countries out there and I can't spend too much time, nobody can spend too much time thinking about what it's like, what the domestic environment for the people who live there. Ultimately, the main thing that I'm concerned about is, do I feel glad that Saudi Arabia is in the world? Is it helping humanity? Is it helping the planet? Is it collaborating with other countries to tackle the grand challenges, the sustainable development goals? All the research shows that this is the number one preoccupation in people's minds. And ultimately, you can spend as much as you want on making attractive cities and attractive destinations. But in the end, if people don't feel that they're glad that you exist on the earth, then there are strict limits to how much they're going to admire you. And yet we have seen such sweeping reforms across the kingdom over the last six years. We've seen things like the removal of the ban on women driving. We've seen the removal of the female guardianship laws. There's no more religious police as well. We know the kingdom donates heavily, contributes heavily in foreign aid as well. Yet on your nation index, which has been done in conjunction with Ipsos, the kingdom is still ranked in 57th place. Why aren't these reforms being able to move the needle as such? Well, the first thing to say is that the, of the examples you gave there, there are two categories. The ones about allowing women to drive and the removal of the male guardianship law, those are domestic issues. And as I said, the, the, the reality of the world is that um, you've got 8 billion people out there who have to somehow find time to think about nearly 200 countries and domestic changes within another country are things that they probably don't even hear about, quite honestly. From Riyadh, it looks as if the whole world was discussing male guardianship laws and, 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 and women being allowed to drive. But, but I think the, they were. I saw multiple headlines across the world, front pages, about Saudi women driving. So I feel stories like that really did make international headlines. But, but the, the other data that you've got to look at is how much international news people consume. And some of the, some of the research done by, the, uh, by um, I believe, the Pew Center, if I'm not mistaken, about consumption of, of international news shows that uh, it's only a very small proportion of the world's population that even reads about other countries. So the fact that the story is out there doesn't necessarily mean either that the majority of the world's population is paying attention to it, or B, um, that they're actually taking it in or remembering it for more than a few seconds. One of the dangers is that if you've got um, a policy like, for example, not allowing women to drive, and you change that policy, there's actually a serious risk that you're going to uh, you're going to um, um, to emphasize the fact that up until now women weren't allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia, and the reaction of a lot of people in other parts of the world when they did read that story was, "What? You mean women weren't allowed to drive?" And they end up with a more negative perception of Saudi Arabia than they had before. Because even if the law has only just been changed, they're going to say, well, it's only just been changed in 2021. That's insane, or whenever the, the year was. Do you, see, do you see the point? What, what it looks like from a subjective point of view in Saudi Arabia is something to be super proud of. But to somebody who knows absolutely nothing about the country, it's actually a bit shocking. Same applies to the male guardianship laws. Now, you also mentioned giving aid. Now, giving aid, of course, is an international issue, and that is absolutely the right thing for rich countries to be doing. The problem with that is that if you do it with the expectation that people are going to admire you as a result, then you're likely to be disappointed because there's nothing very original about it. It's the right thing to do, but it doesn't necessarily win you respect. And the reason it doesn't win you respect is because most people around the world know that this is what rich countries do. Rich countries have a habit of giving away their spare cash to poor countries. It's part of the behavior pattern of rich countries. 
but it feels like it's impossible to make any progress on this. As unfair as it sounds, but I work in the media and journalists by default often focus on the negative story. And similarly, audiences only expect a rich country such as the kingdom to make generous donations. So in other words, it feels like countries such as Japan, Germany or Canada will always come out on top. And countries in this part of the world, such as Saudi, Qatar or the UAE, are going to stay where they are no matter what they do. No, I don't think that is what's happening. I think that, I guess what I'm saying here, it may sound very negative, um, but really all I'm saying is, I'm not saying that change is not possible. I'm saying that change is not easy and it's not quick. Because I think it's very, very important to manage the expectations of governments who tend to think of these uh, these issues uh, using the, the parallel of domestic politics, where uh, often the talk is about changing people's minds overnight or in countries where they have elections, um, building up to the next election, we need to change people's minds. And sometimes you can do that. But when you're talking about the whole of the world and you're talking about a vast cultural construct, as I called it before, which is the, the, the perceived image of a nation, that really is a slow process. But it can happen and it, it does happen. And there are examples to show the, the last 20 years or so, the countries that consistently, imaginatively, strategically um, work to, um, to do the right thing for their own people and for people outside their own borders, to do the right thing for their own slice of territory and for the whole planet, over time, their images do improve. Uh, South Korea is a very good example of that. It's consistently beaten uh, pretty much every other country in the Nation Brands Index since we started running it back in 2005, because over time, it's taken a more and more responsible and more and more principled role in regional affairs, in conflict resolution with North Korea, in donating money to poorer countries, which can play a part, but only a small part, and by sharing its culture with the rest of the world. So it can work, but it requires a very long-term view which incidentally is easier in, an, in a hereditary monarchy than it is in, a, uh, in an elected uh, democracy. Because one of the challenges in an elected democracy is, is keeping the strategy running from one administration to the next. If you've got an inherited monarchy, then it's very much easier to take the long view in the interests of the state over time to be looking in generational terms because that's what you need to do. But examples are there um, to show that countries can do this right if they take the long view and if they're patient and wise and intelligent and imaginative about it. OK, well, let's talk about this year's Nation Brand Index results. Now, according to recent reports, Russia, perhaps unsurprisingly, has fallen 31 places to the bottom of the index in one year. So are such steep drops common in your Nation Brand Index and, and what does it signify? Well, you know, um, Katie, I've often joked over the over the last 20 years that the Nation Brands Index is one of the most boring social surveys ever conducted, simply because the rankings change so little from year to year. And we know why that is. As I said before, it's because people really, really don't change their minds about countries. These are the stable building blocks of their worldview. So when a country does rise or fall by more than two or three places in the ranking, then that's really important and it's really worth analysing. So up until uh, this last year, up until 2021, the biggest fall ever recorded uh, was in the international image of China following the pandemic year, when it fell by, I think it was about 11 places. It recovered in the following year. 11 places was absolutely seismic. We'd never seen anything like that before. And by the way, we've never seen a country rise by more than two places uh, from one year to the next. In the latest edition, 2022, uh, Russia, as a result of uh, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, fell, as you said, by over 30 places. Um, it, it literally, uh, Russia's brand image, if we want to use that, that, that phrase, has vaporized. And this was to a degree expected, because one of the things that we've found in running this survey ever since 2005 is that international public opinion will not tolerate conflict. The one thing that, uh, that, that people all over the world just cannot forgive a country for is being involved in a war. If you reach out and you harm or threaten or insult another group, uh, whether that's a religious group or, or, or another state, uh, public opinion will punish you as a state for doing so. 
In fact, one of the previous examples of this was the was the uh, the famous cartoons episode. When you'll remember uh, back in 2006, I think it was a Danish newspaper uh, published some cartoons lampooning the Prophet Muhammad. And what we saw in the Nation Brands Index was that the image of Denmark absolutely collapsed in the Muslim world and still hasn't recovered today. So any state that reaches out and actively harms, threatens or abuses another state uh, will suffer reputational damage, which can last a very, very long time. So is Israel the exception to this? Because it continues to occupy illegal lands as per the United Nations, but it doesn't suffer the same as Russia. It doesn't suffer quite the same because it hasn't just happened right now. Uh, it's a situation which people have been rather used to and shouldn't have become used to, but have been used to for a number of years. Having said that, Israel um, is nowhere near the bottom of the index, but it's also nowhere near the top of the index. Um, considering the size of its economy and considering its successes and the connections that it enjoys uh, with other countries, its position in the international community, especially since the Abraham Accords and all the rest of it, you might expect Israel to rank significantly higher than it does. So there are a lot of people out there who rank Israel really rather low, and no doubt we don't know because we're, we're not asking open-ended questions here, but no doubt that's because those people don't approve of its behavior in the occupied territories. OK, well, let's talk about a topic close to home for you. You are from the UK. So I'm curious, how has your own country scored following the Brexit vote and what can now only be described as the rapidly rotating door of number 10 Downing Street? Yeah. Um, chaotic politics is so much the order of the day in world affairs these days that I don't think uh, just changing prime ministers every few weeks is going to have any long term effect on the image of the country. Um, it might surprise a few people. But again, remember what I said before, most people don't really consume very much international news. And they're certainly not all that interested in the domestic politics of other countries. Having said that, the image of the United Kingdom is on the slide and has been barring a few reversals ever since the Brexit referendum. And the reason for that is very, very clear to me. As I said before, the analysis I've been doing over the years of this data very clearly shows the number one reason why people admire a country is because they think it contributes something to humanity and the planet. The point about Brexit, as it was understood by most people around the world, was that the United Kingdom was withdrawing from its multilateral behaviors and wanted to go it on its own. It wanted to be the British Empire all over again. Very predictably, people don't like that. And very predictably, therefore, its results are starting to slide. The fact that it's spending less money on foreign aid, the fact that it's uh, paying so much attention to keeping out migrants from other countries and all the rest of it, this is not good for the image of the UK. I said before that um, almost the only way that you can quickly damage the image of a country is by invading another. The only way that you can slowly, gradually damage the image of a country is by behaving in a persistently uh, chaotic, turbulent and unfriendly way in the international community. And both the United States and the United Kingdom are proving that. From year to year to year to year, their scores slip. In the Nation Brands Index, the United States had always been the number one country, right up until the second term of George uh, W. Bush when uh, the Americans invaded uh, Iraq for the second time. America was always the most admired country on earth. Now it never is. It seems to have settled down at around about seventh to 10th position. And the world's most admired country is now in a very stable state and it's Germany. And it's always there at the top. Germany and Japan first and second. And that's interesting because if you look back 70 years, Germany and Japan were more or less where Russia is today, pariahs, universally despised uh, warmongers. So 70 years is how long it took from Germany and Japan to become the most detested countries to most admired countries. And there again, if you like, is proof that if you've got the patience, things can really change. Certainly long term strategies there. Um, I just want to ask you one final question, uh, focusing on the UK again. Uh, the passing of the late Queen Elizabeth has really divided public opinion on the future of the monarchy there. Of course, critics come out and say how much the monarchy costs the UK taxpayer. But I'd be interested to see how much you think, uh, you know, she and the monarchy as a whole is worth for brand UK. I did I did some some work on this a few years ago because I'm I'm often asked questions of this sort and it certainly looks to me if you look at monarchies uh, in purely economic terms on the whole they tend to give quite good value for money 
Um, I did some calculations around uh, one or two members of the Danish royal family as well as the British royal family. And what it seems to suggest is that, uh, yes, they cost uh, taxpayers um, several millions a year, sometimes many millions a year uh, to keep them there. But what they actually return to the country's image in terms of pure brand value is in the order of billions. People love monarchies, especially people who don't live in monarchies themselves. Nobody on earth, according to my research, admires monarchs and monarchies quite so much as people who live in republics. And, um, and this is very important because it's a really significant part of the perception of the cultural attributes, the history, the tourism attraction of the country. Without the monarchy, the UK would be significantly less interesting to people than it is. It would be significantly harder to attract people to visit its old buildings and its old cities. So my general view is that purely in economic terms, royal families appear to, do, to give rather good value, as long as they behave in the right way. Well, certainly some fascinating insights there. Mr. Anhold, thank you for joining us on Frankly Speaking today. We appreciate your time. It was a pleasure.